Everyone wants a great deal in real estate, but how many people actually know a great deal when they see one? In this video, we're gonna talk about how I evaluate properties for my clients every single day to help them make sure they're paying fair market value or below. If you're a buyer active in the market today, if you're a seller thinking about listing your home, even if you're a tenant who's considering maybe purchasing down the line, Evaluating property values is critical to making successful decisions. In any transaction, it's important to come back to fair market value. And that's really what we're looking for when we run data on any property in the marketplace. Is it priced at or below fair market value? The exception would be if a multiple offer situation happens. If enough people are willing to bid a property over fair market value, okay, you can probably justify the, the value based on the demand for that specific asset. That's what appraisals are. When you hear about an appraisal with your purchase, if you already bought, you had to go through that likely if you used a loan or maybe you've reappraised uh, in order to get a, a better loan. You are talking about a bank's assessment or a third party's assessment of your property value. Appraisals cost money though. So most people, like for example, when you're making a purchase before you make an offer or if you just own a house and you're thinking about listing, most people don't pay to have an appraisal, which is several hundred dollars, before they do that stuff. It's really just a step that's not needed, although you certainly can do it. They instead rely on market data. And usually they rely on a real estate agent to help them get the latest and greatest market data available. So today we're going to walk through my thought process and my methodology of breaking down market data. How do I approach each property to assess its market value and to share that with my clients when they're making decisions? This happens in two capacities. For my buy side clients, I'm working with a buyer to help make sure they're not overspending on an asset. Whether they're investing or they're just buying to live in it themselves, you don't wanna overspend on the front end because ultimately the biggest limitation on your future profits with your purchase is your purchase price. It doesn't matter how much you improve the property, it doesn't matter how much rent goes up if you're gonna do that one day, if you overpay on the front end, you will forever be chasing those profits back. So it's critical to evaluate assets on the front end and make sure that you're paying at or below fair market value using the available data. If you're a tenant watching this video and you're just considering that whole rent versus buy decision, I have another video talking about rent prices in Chicago and where they've headed, kind of where they're going from here. I would strongly advise connect with a lender, see how much you can afford in this marketplace and at least consider buying because the rental market might not be as favorable as you'd hope in the near future. If you're a seller and you're thinking about going on market, this is equally important to you because frankly, buyers aren't going to pay over market value for an asset. In one capacity, they can't. They're gonna have to get an appraisal and an appraiser is gonna look at your home and say, it's not worth that value. And unless we're in a super competitive market, like maybe we had in 2021, 2022 in the beginning of the year, there's probably not enough stomach from the buyers to cover any sort of appraisal gap that would come in that situation, meaning you're going to have to reduce your price to the appraised value anyway. So in the beginning, it's important to run data that you feel confident in so that when a buyer asks you, why are you listed at this price? Why should I pay you this many hundreds of thousands of dollars for your home? you should be able to justify that to them and to justify it using data from recent sales in the local marketplace. So how do I think about comparable sales? Really, in a city like Chicago, you have to get hyper local and hyper local changes based on the product category. If we're in a large high rise building, your comparable sales are your neighbors. The other sales in that building recently that have transacted are far and away your toughest competitors. That's what everybody who's looking in the building is going to see. Sure, you want to look outside that building in secondary similar buildings, see if you find other uh, similar size buildings with similar amenities, similar square footage units, similar updates, and generally make sure that the pricing is fair across the board. But ultimately, these buildings are small economies. So one building might universally sell for more expensive prices than the building right next door. And on paper, you'll see it, but you won't be able to explain it. And, and that's just a reality with high rises. So Running data for those is, is one subset of how you do things. Another example would be if you're looking at you know, single family homes, for example. If you're looking at single family, the buyer probably has kids and therefore is evaluating school districts. So all of a sudden, when you're comparing values, school district starts to play into property values. And one property being across the street from another and being in a different school zone could have tens of thousands of dollars of impact on that property's value. So when you're running comps, you need to be looking at 
like assets. In a large building, like assets is other units in that building. If it's something like single family, it's other single families in that neighborhood, in that school district, in that community. If it's condos, same thing. It might be a three flat. You want to look at other three flat sales. Not only that, but you're trying to look for other three flat sales, the same floor. If this is a third floor unit, look for other third floor sales. If this is a ground floor unit, look for other ground floor units. So you want to get as close to a light comparison unit as possible. And you're going to do this over what I would recommend is a three to six months time frame. So when you're working with your agent, when you're working with an appraiser, generally speaking, they're looking six months back. But I like to be a little bit more strict than that. I'm usually focused three months back. The reason for that is pretty straightforward. Markets shift fast. So last year, beginning of the year, the market that we had in January, February, March, pretty active. Interest rates were still low. Buyers were in multiple offer situations. That completely flipped on its head in May, June, July. And the market completely slowed down to the point where we saw activity almost entirely dry up. So if you're evaluating on a longer time frame, there's more volatility that's bound to happen over that six month time frame. If you look only three months back, you get a very focused hyper set of data. If looking three months back, there's not enough comparable data, certainly you want to expand that time frame. Speaking of enough data, I tend to aim for 10 properties of reference. Those properties need to be a mix of active properties on market because that's your competition who hasn't won yet, but you're actively competing against for these buyer's eyes. The, num the second set would be properties under contract. That's people who have won enough that they got a buyer to buy that property or at least put it in writing that they will buy the property. And then there's close. Those are the winners, right? They were able to sell the property. That data is almost most valuable because it tells you what had to be done at what price point to sell a similar asset. You put those all together and you run comparable data. In some places, price per square foot is a big deal. In cities like Chicago, I'll be transparent, it's not always a reliable indicator. So you have to break down data in different ways. I look at the purchase price first, just straight up value for value. If it's roughly the same size and it delivers the same asset, they both have washer dryer and they both have a parking space or whatever it might be, they should on paper be roughly the same price, right? It's very logical. If you can get a square footage, if they happen to include it, if they took the measurements, that's great. Use price per square foot as an evaluation tool, but there are no requirements for sellers to take square footage estimates or measurements, I should say. And more so, there's no stipulations around how they have to take them. So it just because somebody says 900, that might be like their best guess. It has nothing to do with the actual square footage. So take that into account when you're running numbers. I choose to just focus on the numbers themselves. And then I look to make sure nothing else is out of alignment. So for example, if the tax bill on one property is exponentially higher or lower than another property, why? Do they get an exemption? Is that going to be a problem for you? Can you expect the same? Are you going to have a rough adjustment up in some near future? So you want to be looking for obvious metrics that are standing in your face. When you're evaluating condos, you also need to ask more questions about budgets, repairs, reserves, things like that. You certainly want to ask questions like that when you're buying a single family home, right? If you're buying an asset and recently another home sold and you see that in the listing it says that home has a new roof, that's valuable. And it should play into how you compare with that property. If your roof isn't new, how much would it cost to get there? right? You need to be thinking of that in terms of comparative value. With condos, the story is a little more complicated. Most condo buildings, all condo buildings have a reserve fund. That reserve fund is there to take care of major projects. So your questions are still the same. When did you replace the roof? When did you do the tuck pointing? How old are the major critical appliances? But the reasoning behind them is slightly different because it's a shared asset. You want to be making sure is the board budgeting for necessary repairs and upkeep? Do you have healthy reserves in case there's a rainy day repair that needs to be made? And questions like, you know, are there common special assessments in the building that I should be aware of and preparing for? So you put this all together, and this is going to give you a comprehensive value that you should expect to pay for that property if it transacts at fair market value. So when I'm sharing with clients, if you come to me and say, Matt, I love this property, I want to make an offer, the way I'm going to advise you is twofold. Number one is the you should talk to your lender and have a conversation to make sure you can affordably, comfortably live in this property. That will also guide how much you want to spend on the property. Part of running comparative analysis on the buy side is how much do you want to spend? Only you can decide that number. Once you figure that out, we'll compare that with the number I give you, which is the fair market value of this property using recent data in the marketplace. 
hopefully those numbers are close. Maybe you'd be willing to spend even higher than fair market value, which is great. You found a deal that's comfortably in your budget. What we don't want is something where fair market value of the home far exceeds what you can comfortably spend. Because in that situation, barring some extreme negotiation, it's probably a home that's not a good fit for you. The fair market value is quite a bit more than you can comfortably afford. So that's why we do this. We run numbers to compare the world of what you want and what you can afford with your lender with the fairness of the marketplace in action. And in real estate, the only way we can really evaluate market fairness, fair market value, however you want to think about it, is by using recent like-for-like -like transactions in the local marketplace to assess what a home should transact in the future, right? So it's not a perfect science. It's a trailing science. And oftentimes you see low appraisals coming out of transitory markets. If winter was tough on sales, it could be a little bit of a learning curve before high appraisals come back in the spring. So there are transitions in markets and we can only use data that's already available, meaning closed sales, contracts, uh, or, or homes under contract, or new listings. If you're thinking about evaluating a property, making an offer, or going on market, I strongly advise connecting with a real estate professional. This whole video has been about the importance of taking data in a very local, very recent way and using it to your advantage to assess what a property should transact for. You can try to do that on your own, and I certainly would encourage you to do it if you feel like going through those cycles. But the reality is the re real estate license itself gives me as an agent access to data you don't have yet. I can see transactions faster than you can in a central repository that you don't have access to. So if you want somebody to be running up to date, hyper local data, using every bit of information and knowledge that they have to their advantage, a real estate professional who has access to those tools is really gonna be your strongest asset. So connect with them early in the search and make sure you're evaluating properties before you invest your money so that you can ensure you're making profits when you sell. If you're evaluating properties and you want help finding fair market value, don't hesitate to book time on my calendar. I'm always happy to run numbers with you and talk through the recent competition and expectations for that sale. Use data to your advantage in the home buying or home selling process. Ultimately, it's all we have to rely on in assessing fair market value.